through press technology and obviously processing. As uh, you heard earlier, the term technology or with auto speed processing, it's hard for me to use because this stuff hasn't changed for very, very long. Uh, there's not a better example of that than screw press, which hasn't changed fundamentally in the 100 years since it was a first invented. So here's an uh, overview of the presentation. Uh, we'll talk about future, future of the screw presses, the uh, major components, operational philosophy, how you could alter it for various processes in auto speed processing. Then we'll get into auto speed processing ba basics. It's used in both mechanical and solvent extraction. Then we'll get into all the major advances in screw presses. While it hasn't changed much, the efficiency has been driven by improvements in press. And the, the greatest improvement is in press has come from the dry oil seed industry. And we'll talk about that, and then we'll have some concluding remarks after that. So the, sorry, I don't want to cancel this up. Okay. Um, the screw bus was first invented in 1900 by Mr. V.D. Anderson. He was a uh, engineer, and he had a lot, a lot of contacts in the uh, meat packing industry. And he saw the outdated way that they were recovering fat from the meat scraps. They would use a batch system, uh, hydraulic press. And it was a laborious process of loading, pressing, unloading. So when he came up with the, the screw press, it was a revolutionary process for that industry. And not um, far thereafter, we had our first commercial client, Sherwin Williams, also in Cleveland, who bought the first commercial screw press for oil seed applications. Every screw press has the same major and there are the same components that were there back in 1900. You have your main drive motor, which supplies the electrical energy or force to, to do the work that you want to accomplish in the press. Then you have your gearbox, which transfers that energy from the motor to the shaft, which is doing the work on the material. That gearbox is a torque multiplier. The greater the reduction in that gearbox, the more squeezing force and the more torque that you can generate. The downside, though, is you spin slower so you can't do as much work on as much material at once. So the gearbox transfers that force to the shaft. The shaft then does work on the material that you're trying to process. And as we know from Newton, when you apply a force to an object, it applies an equal force in the opposite direction. That is the thrust force that's generated in all screw machines. To support or counteract that force, all screw presses will have a thrust unit with a thrust bearing. If that's not there, you're going to push that shaft out of the back of that press. So you have your shaft then that does work on the material. It does work by ch changing the geometry to generate pressure in that machine. The amount of pressure you need depends on what type of work you're trying to do. You then have a drainage gauge, which its goal is to maintain the solids inside of the machine while allowing as many liquid, as much liquid out. At the end of the machine, most screw presses have a choke or some means to control the final overall pressure in that machine. Though a lot of the newer machines will have fixed chokes just due to, due to the cost sensitivity of the screw press industry, the oil seed industry in general. So the uh, most important component of the screw press is the shaft. That determines how much work and what type of work you're trying to do. When Mr. Anderson first invented the shaft, he had what we would call a continuous screw where there weren't any interruptions here. What he found out is he was overpressurizing his system and blowing up barrels like crazy. To solve this problem, he put interruptions in here, which acted as a pressure relief. When he built in those interruptions, he had another issue that come up, is the material would co-rotate with the shaft because you lose the ability to press through this section. So what he did is he came up with a knife bar, which looked like these little perforations in the barrel, which simply limit the co-rotation of the product with the shaft. This is a simplified representation of the screw pressure as you go from the inlet to the outlet of the machine. I like to compare it to rinsing out a wet rag. You're applying pressure, you're squeezing. You, you can only squeeze so much when stuff stops coming out, but if you let go and squeeze again, you're always able to get a little bit more oil out, or sorry, water out in the case of a wet rag. So again, you're just squeezing, let it go, squeezing, let it go. Uh, so how do you determine what type of work you can do with the shaft? 
there's two counteractive principles, speed and torque. So the slower you rotate that shaft, the more torque or the more pressing force you have, the harder you squeeze. But when you rotate slower, of course, you can't push as much weight through that machine. Um, when you spin faster, you generate a shear force. This shows you that shear is proportional to the change in velocity with relationship to some plane y. So the faster you rotate, you get a shear force. The slower you rotate, you squeeze harder. The other way you generate resistance or work in the shaft uh, is by changing the geometry. So you could vary the pitch, which is simply the uh, axial distance that a flight must travel to complete 360 degrees of wrap. Or you could change your barrel or hub diameter, just uh, re changing the open volume that the material has to be forced into to generate pressure. Uh, the next most important part is the barrel. You want to, again, keep as many solids in as possible while also letting out as many fluids as possible. And this design hasn't really changed in over 90 years either. Um, you have a semicircle frame where you line up the barrel bars. Inside these bars, you put spacings in between each, or you have them welded on, depending on how much you want to pay for that bar. Um, and you stack these up to fit into the semicircle. Um, when you get to the end, you want to make sure you have your fixed barrel diameter. If you're too big, you're not going to generate the resistance you think you're going to generate. If you're too small, you're not going to seal these gaps in between both barrel halves, and you'll make a mess and get fined up. So what we came up with is this gap A to ensure that we have the proper circumference when you compress these two halves together. Now, with the OLC processing, this is just an introduction. I can't talk, talk about the screw press without mentioning OLC processing. This is a simplified diagram of my interpretation of OLC processing. You have your oil, you input energy, steam, electrical energy, and the goal is to separate this into oil and meal, with the oil being worth three to four times as much as the meal. So OLC processing is just trying to limit your energy input while maximizing the amount of oil that you're recovering. I like to break down the uh, process, uh, preparation in three steps. Cleaning, you don't, you don't want to paint across your trash. Uh, size reduction, the smaller you make this particle size, the more exposed surface area you have per unit volume, and the less distance the oil has to travel to get out of that other cell. And then you have heat treatment, and there's three different types of heat treatment in my mind. There's heating, which is simply raising the temperature of the oil to reduce viscosity so it's easier to separate. You have drying, which is drying out moisture from that material. Screw presses do not like moisture. Um, Pre-pressing, 5%. Full pressing, you're usually at three to four percent moisture going. But you also have cooking, which is constant temperature, constant moisture. Moisture is key for heat transfer. And what it does is you start breaking down this material at the microscopic level, where size reduction does it at the macroscopic level. You start breaking down the membranes that traps the oil, and you can also start to deactivate some harmful enzymes that are naturally present inside these oil seeds. Now, of course, you have your extraction step, and right now there's two primary extraction. Uh, steps available in the industry, some extraction being the more preferred, especially at the higher capacities, simply due to the higher efficiency of it. You usually leave less than 1% oil in your final meal. When you're pressing or using mechanical processing, you usually can't get below 5 or 6%. You can only squeeze so hard before it's not economical to make the press bigger or stronger. Just try to squeeze out any additional oil from that material. So some extraction is favored at high rates, <laughs> Mechanical extraction is favored at lower rates, more specialty oil seeds. The screw press can be used in both of these processing methods. And I have the same photo of the same press here simply because the machine doesn't really change much. All that changes is going back to that fundamental principle that the faster you rotate, the, the softer you squeeze. In pre pressing and salt extraction, it's used on high oil content materials that aren't soy beans. All extractors are designed. For soy. As you saw, it's more than 50% of the industry by processing volume. Anything that's not soybean, you have to pre press down to 20% before going into that extractor. So, pre pressing the same press, but you just rotate faster so you don't squeeze as hard, but you push more material through so you can run a much, much higher rate. Again, uh, the opposite is full pressing, you rotate slower, squeeze harder, you can get down to that 5 to 6% RO range in your final meal. Uh, you can see the variations in, in operating costs in terms of electrical energy. You're using about four times electrical energy to full press versus pre press. So, screw press technology. I 
show this picture because you can see in the first Anderson Press in 1910 and uh, one of our newer presses in 2018, they all have these same components in them. The fundamentals of pressing have not changed very much at all. Uh, we were still able to press down to 5 to 8% back in 1910, and we're still doing it now. What has changed and driven the performance of the machines forward has been the preparation used before it to reduce the energy consumption per ton in the actual screw set. So some of the general changes that have happened, uh, screw presses have become a lot easier to work on. Uh, this is an uh, HF press, Turkey's HF press over in Germany, I think they're in here somewhere. Um, this is just showing a very maintenance friendly barrel design. Uh, the barrels are so big and heavy on the machine that it's impractical to try to carry them around. So it's pinned to the barrel for easy maintenance on this drainage cage to rewind that drainage cage. Uh, where life, people have discovered new types of hard facing, new metals, new heat treatment processes to extend the life of these parts longer and longer. Uh, when they're this big, it's tedious to repair these things. Obviously, downtime is very expensive. You want them to last as long as you can. Chokes have changed. Uh, not too many people use adjustable chokes. Fixed chokes are, are kind of the norm now in the industry just because of their um, low cost. Uh, controls, obviously the press automation has grown as automation technology has grown. Um, you could have a completely automated startup sequence where you just press start and everything could, uh, starts up on its own in sequence. You could suppress balance. Uh, but the biggest thing has, has been the size of the press. Um, I think Rose Down now has the largest press out there. They just came out with an 18 inch diameter press with up to a thousand more sprawl on it. That's gigantic. Uh, those are mainly used in the pre pressing market for full pressing, though. So, again, going back to the major advances in pressing technology, most of it has come in the prep. And to date, the most advanced preparation system that we have is high shear extrusion. High shear extrusion. And it falls in this range of this little prep flow sheet. It combines both size reduction and all your heat treatment in one step. So you could get rid of your flaking mills, your, your stack cookers, your dryers, all that's done in one unit operation in a much smaller footprint and a much lower investment. So I want to talk a little bit more about cooking just to emphasize its importance and also processing and how people kind of use drying and cooking in the same sentence when I, I firmly believe they're separate um, operating steps. Um, we're trying to extract this oil from a uh, oil seed from a biological material that needs this to grow. It's not just freely dispersed in this material, it is trapped within a cell membrane. So if you could break or rupture this cellular membrane through heat treatment, it's a lot easier to get this oil out of this oil seed. So it drastically reduces the amount of torque you need in the press so that you could then spin it faster and get a higher rate, yet still get the same amount of oil out. Um, there's other benefits, of course, with cooking, Soybean being the most uh, commonly processed oil seed, everyone knows about trypsin inhibitor and urease. Those are simply enzymes, which are proteins. Cooking again will break down the uh, quaternary tertiary structure of the proteins so that those enzymes cannot act to harm the animals the way they normally would. So this is a high shear extruder. Um, there's only a few groups out there that I know that, that make it. There's uh, us, Insapro, I think uh, Granto in the Ukraine. It is a dry extruder. It will mechanically break down the material to a degree greater than flaking. It generates frictional heat, so you don't need any steam whatsoever. It accelerates the temperature very, very rapidly, so that you have a very short residence time cook time. So you're, while you're destroying the, um, some of the, uh, the enzymes, you're not in there for long enough time to be detrimental and generate free fatty acid or degrade the oil in, in uh, other ways related to heat. And the frictional heat that's generated is enough to flash off moisture at the discharge such that you know you need no further drying on soybean for the uh, expeller processing. We could go directly from the extruder into the press. And it cuts the energy consumption in the press by half, and it doubles the wear life of the parts in the press. So a press that could do four tons per hour can now do eight tons an hour just by adding this extruder upstream of it, and you get rid of all the other prep equipment from that plant. So extruder, again, that is a, a branch off from the screw press or the interrupted flight screw machine. Uh, similar principles, but you're focusing on that in that speed range where you're shearing that oil seed. You are accelerating it to extreme velocities. Uh, we kind of use a Venturi nozzle design to 
to really accelerate that um, solid particle over a small distance and shear it against a solid metal surface. Um, and you can see right here, this is the material as it's been exiting the oil has clearly been released from its confines in the oil seed. So it's very, very easy to extract now. So this just operates in the solid barrel range. All energy goes into the material and it's very, very high speed, meaning a lot of shear force. So then this uh, next breaks down the economics of traditional processing, flaking, preheating, cooking, drying, birth, using an extruder in a mechanical soybean plant. Um, this adds up the kilowatt hours per ton, the steam energy per ton, and if this is a soybean plant, obviously your heat is going to vary by your climate, but your moisture content is up your bean, but the uh, flaking is pretty consistent. Um, your pressing is down here about 70 kilowatt hours per ton. Uh, then we simplify this process greatly. You crack really only if you want to be all. Um, we have plenty of clients that keep the bean whole in the computer. You extrude, and then you go right in, into the press, and the press engine consumption drops down to 35 kilowatt hours per ton. Of course, we have a lot of excess electrical energy here, but there is zero steam in this. And then here, I know charts are in to read in a presentation, but this breaks it down and adds up all the utility, um, showing that you're at about 73 kilowatt hours per ton when you're using the extrusion system, and you're right about the same when you're using the full press system without the extruder. The huge savings here is you don't have any steam, so you either have no boiler system or you have a very small boiler system if you still need to dry or of course you could dry using um, gas. And then, you know, it greatly reduces your, your capex. Um, steam utilities are, are gone, much smaller footprint. We like to just stack the extruder on top of the press so it feeds directly into it. No elaborate steam piping, no boiler system, no giant stack cooker, um, no steam coats to worry about, no boiler engineer in the plant. Um, the expeller press doubles in capacity keeps the same RO, usually drops it if you're not already down to that 5% range. And you get much higher quality oiled meal because your cook step is such short residence time that it's very, very gentle on the raw materials when compared to being in a big steam vessel for a 20 to 30 minutes residence time. Um, and you also get the added benefit of you double the expeller wear life while also doubling its capacity. So in terms of um, maintenance per ton, you quadruple that. And again, in, in conclusion, um, while this presentation was entitled Screw Press Technology, the screw press over 100 years fundamentally has not changed in principle very much. The focus has been on improving prep so this machine can do what it does best, which is the solid liquid separation. And right now, the high shear extrusion is the best available technology for preparing the oil seeds for full pressing systems. Any questions? Just your experience using extruder with the um, canola or rapeseed or that um, and then full pressing, has there been many plants doing that? Yeah, we have uh, probably close to 10 now. The difficulty when you're doing a high oil content seed is that you now have a substantially more volume of oil in the extruder and the extruder is going to release oil like you said. When it does that to the soybean, it makes a mess of canola with the amount of oil it releases. Oil is going to go into the path of least resistance. It goes back to the feed barrel. You flood the machine. It can't feed. We do have an extruder now with a drainage cage built into it. So it allows a place for that free oil that you do generate to drain off. It allows you to operate that. But again, now you're driving more. You're driving a significant amount of oil out of an extruder. So you do still need a dryer before going to the press. Because when you drop your oil that much, your relative moisture goes up. And you still got to drop it down a bit before you go in the press. But yeah, it's, it still does work. We have a, a fair amount of systems on it. Canola is also a very tough on the process because you can't grip it in an extruder. You still got to flake it. So the economics now, they are like they are. So yeah. We're working to solve that in the feed barrel and the extruder, but it's not done yet. Where we can still get rid of the flake. Somebody else? Yeah, your extruders are, I guess, sized to match your, your expeller. Did you have a. Yeah, so our market? drive extruders are six ton an hour. Our biggest press will take six ton an hour with that. So in, in the uh, in the extruder, when you 
get to 300 F, you seem to do a great job of getting URI below the 0.2. I think it came down to 0.1 now that people want to see. So it's usually around 300 F. Um, trips and inhibitors still kind of a challenge, but there's uh, creative ways to get, get around that and get that down lower without adding additional steam. But yeah, 300 F to 320 F is usually the range in the extrusion so for about eight seconds. So where would that uh, go around? than the expeller. I mean, expeller, we get 260, 280F, but you're slower in the expeller, so a little bit more resonance time. The extruder, you're only in there for 20 seconds, and you're only hot at the very discharge for a few seconds. And once you discharge, you drive moisture flashes off because of all the superheat, which takes up a lot of heat um, right there. So, I mean, you're in a stack cooker for 20, 25 minutes at 110, 115C, so um, I mean, we'll see drop in peroxide anisiding levels in the oil when an extruder is used. Um, there's no generation of FFA in the extrusion process that we've ever measured or had complaints about. And you threw out the term cold pressing, which is thrown around a lot, poorly defined term. To me, it just means you're not using heat pre-treatment. You can't avoid generating heat in the press unless, like I said, you squeeze softer and you don't generate as much heat, but then you're not squeezing hard, you're not doing a good job pressing. Thank you very much.